In this video, I will show how to use an infrared reflection sensor to measure the speed of the RC vehicle. The video will cover the mounting of the sensor, to measure the speed of the vehicle drive shaft, as well as how to collect the data using GPIO interrupts. The video will also cover the key steps of debouncing and filtering of the raw data, to obtain a fairly consistent speed signal that can be used by the autonomous vehicle policy. Note that this video was meant to be covering the DAGA behavior cloning algorithm. I kind of got sidetracked. This is the tenth video in the overall project. The project is to build a deep learning Raspberry Pi controlled autonomous vehicle. The project will cover the system from end to end, from building the hardware, the base RC chassis, and attaching the Raspberry Pi and the associated electronics, and then getting it all working. It then works through the planning and development of the software that controls it all, as well as the training and the testing of various machine learning algorithms to see how well they go at line following. After training a few behavior cloning policies, I have decided to revisit the question of how to measure the speed of the vehicle. Just a quick recap of what we've been doing. The vehicle has four main components, the camera, the Raspberry Pi, the steering, and the motor. For the autonomous driving, we take images in from the camera and process these with the neural network policy. The policy outputs a set of steering and motor commands that are used to control the vehicle. Now, as well as using the camera inputs, we also include the recent speed and steering data as inputs to the policy. However, for speed, we are currently only using the PWM signal that's being sent to the speed controller. What I am finding, though, is that the actual speed varies quite a bit for a given PWM value. The speed depends on the state of the battery, and it also depends on the steering angles. Full lock slows the vehicle down quite a bit. So I am going to see if I can somehow measure the actual speed of the vehicle, and use this as another input into the policy model. After some googling, I have decided to try and use the TCRT 5000 based infrared reflection sensor, and I'll see if I can get a reliable, consistent measurement of speed. These sensors are small, cheap, adjustable, and interface directly with the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins. The sensor works by sending out light from an LED and looking for reflections back on the receiving sensor. Infrared light reflects well from white or light colored surfaces and doesn't reflect well from dark colored surfaces. So if we can mount the sensor close to some rotating part of the chassis and attach a piece of reflective material, we should be able to detect the rotation and measure the speed. With the TTO2 chassis, we have good access to the rotating drive shaft. Now most of the chassis is black plastic, which doesn't reflect the infrared light well. But given the shape of the drive shaft, it's relatively easy to either paint a section of it or add a piece of reflective tape to it. So that now the sensor can clearly differentiate between sections of the drive shaft. There is plenty of space around the servo for mounting. I tried heating up and bending a few small pieces of Perspex to see how to best create a simple mounting platform. The idea was to leverage the existing servo mounting posts and to get the sensor LED shining directly on the drive shaft. I'm using aluminium foil tape to provide the reflective section of the shaft. It's good at reflecting infrared light and it's easy to cut and work with. And with the concave shape of the plastic drive shaft, it's easy to fill in a one quarter section of it with tape. The back end of a toothpick helps to firmly stick the tape to the drive shaft. So with the reflective tape in place, I can put all the pieces together, attaching the sensor to the perspex and mounting to the chassis. The overall result is fairly compact and it aligns quite well with the drive shaft. So that's the mechanical side of things. Next, let's check that it's all working on the electrical side. For this, we will have a look at the sensor's output signal on the Raspberry Pi GPIO pin. 
With the sensor connected to a GPIO pin, we can detect changes in the sensor output. As the drive shaft rotates, the sensor will output a high signal when passing over the reflective tape and switch to a low signal when passing over the non-reflective section of the drive shaft. So starting things up, when the shaft starts turning, you can see the resulting waveform on the GPIO pin is rectangular. The period of the waveform is the time taken for the shaft to make one rotation. As you increase the speed, the period decreases. So by measuring the waveform period, we can calculate the shaft speed, which is proportional to 1 over the period. With the Pi, we can capture these transitions between signal levels using interrupts. I played around using both the Raspberry Pi GPIO module as well as the Pi GPIO library. With the Pi GPIO library, it directly gives us the microsecond timestamps and appears to actually give more accurate timing results. Now with any real-world signal, there will always be some measurement noise, so it's generally a good idea to do some kind of filtering. From the speed sensor, assuming it's working well, we should get a reasonably constant stream of interrupts. With each interrupt, we have the associated timestamp. The difference between timestamps gives us the period of rotation, from which we can calculate the shaft speed. So how to filter? Well, we could go with a simple low-pass filter. However, given our vehicle is covered by the equations of motion, we can probably do a little better. There's a whole range of state estimation type filters that are applicable to this type of problem. I'll use what's called a GH filter, and I'll use it to track the time period between measurements. Internally, these filters maintain a simple model to represent how the system varies with time. For our case, the model assumes that the next period value will be roughly equal to the previous value plus an adjustment based on the rate of change of the period. Now the filter basically works like this. Assume we've received the first two interrupts from the speed sensor and calculated the time difference, which gives us the period. This is effectively a measurement of the drive shaft period. This measurement is the input to the filter. Internally, the filter knows how much time has passed since the last update, and it uses its internal model to make an estimate, or a prediction, of the next value. The filter compares the measured and the estimated values, and uses the error to make a small update to the internal model. The result is an updated model, plus the new filtered output value and the process continues. For each interrupt, we calculate the latest measurement of the period. The GH filter uses the measured values to maintain its internal model, and together calculates the filtered output values. Now one problem with interrupts generated from threshold transitions, or switches, is something called bounce. Typically a switch or transition is not a single, clean change in value. For each change, you can often receive multiple interrupts. This was the case with the TCRT5000 sensor. In general, the interrupts were fairly clean, but there were regular spurious interrupts, as well as occasional bursts of multiple short duration interrupts. So some kind of debouncing is needed. We need some kind of a way to detect and remove these additional interrupts. I tried various empirical approaches to debouncing, with timing and threshold parameters, but I actually struggled to reliably catch every case. After a lot of fiddling around, I did actually come up with a solution that seems to work quite well. I found that I could leverage the model from the GH filter to help with the debounce step. Assume that we've had a sequence of clean interrupts, and the periods have been processed through the GH filter. The solution logic is as follows. We need to look at a batch of upcoming interrupts. We are trying to determine which is the next valid interrupt. To do this, we work through each of them one by one. For the first interrupt in the batch, 
assuming this was the valid interrupt, then the shaft period would be P1. So take P1 as our measured period. Now the GH filter has a model that is tracking the period. So how does this measured value compared to the GH filter model prediction? Well, we know how much time has elapsed since the last update, so we can directly estimate the next value based on the model. Comparing the measurement and the estimate gives us an error for this interrupt. It tells us how well this interrupt aligns with what the GH filter model is predicting. We then check out the second interrupt in the batch. What if this interrupt was actually the next valid interrupt? The period would then actually be P2, our measured period. And using the GH filter, we can make a prediction based on the elapsed time of delta T2. Then comparing the measured and estimated values, we come up again with the resulting error. And we do the same thing for the third interrupt in the batch. Maybe this was actually the next valid interrupt. So the calculated interrupt period, P3, we can check what's predicted by the GH filter model and calculate the error. So what we have in the end is a set of error values for each of the interrupts in the batch. The error shows how well the interrupt is predicted by the current GH filter model. So what we do is simply choose the interrupt with the lowest magnitude error. We take this to be the next valid debounced interrupt. So this interrupt is used to update the GH filter and output the next filtered prediction of the drive shaft period. And the process continues. Moving forward from the last debounced interrupt, we grab the next batch of interrupts and calculate the errors between these and the corresponding GH filter predictions. We select the interrupt with the lowest error magnitude, and this becomes the debounced interrupt. So that's the idea. It seems to work okay in practice, but it does need a few tweaks to improve the performance a little bit. Sometimes the sensor sends out a burst of very short period interrupts, like 5, 10 or 20 microseconds. These could be handled by going for a large batch size. But since this increases the filter delay, it's easier to simply ignore interrupts with a very short period. Harmonics. The filter can actually lock onto a multiple of the actual period. So instead of tracking, say, a period P, it could lock on and track a period of 2P. So some kind of a check is needed. In the GH filter, when updating the model derivative value, it's a good idea to limit the update magnitude. Sometimes the initial startup transients can grow exponentially and take a while to recover. So how does it perform? Firstly, let's take a look at some of the period data, the time between interrupts received from the sensor. The data was collected while driving around one of the tracks. The first set of data shows the unfiltered interrupt timings received from the sensor. Some points to notice. The data varies as the vehicle drives. This is because the vehicle actually slows down a bit when the steering wheels are turned. There are periods when we get a consistent stream of interrupts. And there are periods when we get additional bounced interrupts. These bounced interrupts can have a very short time period as well as having larger values, around 50% of the actual shaft period. Now after passing this data through the debouncing GH filter, we get the following outputs. The filter seems to do okay at debouncing the data. There is a delay with the signal of around half a second. The filter uses a buffer of four interrupts to do the debouncing, which helps explain the delay. It's also worth noting that the filter delay varies. This is because we used a fixed buffer for the interrupts. However, the timing between consecutive interrupts does vary. It's interesting to zoom out a bit and see how the speed varies around the track. Starting from zero and ramping the speed controller input signal up to a constant 14% and then to 15%, the actual filtered speed signal is as follows. After the initial startup transients, the speed actually varies quite a bit around a lap, between 400 to 500 RPM, which is around a 20% variation. And one final plot, 
just looking at how the measured speed changes when driving in a straight line. With a couple of step changes in the speed controller input, the raw unfiltered speed varies as expected, showing the gradual acceleration and deceleration of the vehicle. It also has a couple of problems with bounced interrupts. And the filtered signal? It has its initial startup transients, but soon starts tracking the speed quite well. But it does have a bit of a delay. The filtered values seem to handle the bounce problems okay. And finally, a quick overview of the basic software. In terms of the overall solution, the speed sensor probably best fits within the main control module. I've implemented the speed sensor as a self-contained class. The key parts include a callback function. The Pi GPIO library allows you to define a callback function that gets called from the interrupt. The callback function seems to run in its own thread and provides a microsecond timestamp or tick for the interrupt. I've kept the callback function as simple as possible. It just calculates the time delta from the previous interrupt and places it in a FIFO queue. So half of the speed sensor just concerns itself with continually receiving the Pi GPIO callbacks, calculating the time deltas and appending them to the queue. The second part of the code has its own thread for performing the debounce function and running the GH filter processing. The resulting speed values are placed in a length 1 queue, so it's basically a store for the most recent calculated speed value. This filter thread continually loops, grabbing the next value from the time delta queue, performing the debounce and the GH filtering, and finally outputting the updated speed value to the queue. Any other processors can simply query the speed sensor to retrieve the latest speed value. For what it's worth, this is the basic Python code for the speed sensor. I'm not going to go through it, it's fairly self-explanatory. So with a bit of debouncing and filtering, the infrared reflection sensor seems to provide a reasonably easy way to consistently measure the speed of the vehicle. I will be using this as an additional input to the policy models moving forward. In the next video, I'll get back on track and look at the Dagger behavior cloning algorithm. If you want to follow the overall project, please hit the subscribe button and feel free to like or comment.